All right, so we are incredibly honoured to have Philip Gooding with us here today. Um, and Philip is a postdoctoral fellow at the Indian Ocean World Centre uh, and a course lecturer in History and Classical Studies Department at McGill. Um, he's primarily interested in the connections between East African Great Lakes and the wider Indian Ocean world during the 19th century. Uh, and he has um, recently published a book on the frontiers of the Indian Ocean world, a history of um, and then also some uh, an edited collection, uh, which uh, he's recently been involved in editing. Uh, and so today, Philip is going to talk to us about rainfall variability and its effects on 18th to 19th century East African history, uh, research that expands conceptions uh, of uh, terrestrial regions of East Africa, signifying the global significance of East African history. Um, so take it away, Philip. All right, thanks very much for that kind introduction. Um, so this uh, project comes from a wider um, project. Uh, so this paper, I should say, comes from a wider project. I'm led by myself uh, called uh, Climate History and Human Environment Interaction uh, in Equatorial Eastern Africa, circa 1750 to 1900, which itself is part of an even wider project um, at the Indian Ocean World Center, which is entitled Appraising Risk Past and Present. And both of these uh, projects are funded by the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada. The intention within my sub-project focusing on East Africa is to examine how changing agricultural practices and settlement patterns in the context of a changing climate affected the course of East African's history, East Africa's history from the end of the Little Ice Age until the establishment of formal European colonialism. So far, I've used mostly historical methods and existing climatological sources to link changing levels of rainfall to phenomena such as food security, epidemics, commerce, and political, st political stability, focusing mostly on the last quarter of the 19th century. And I'm going to kind of give you a quick list of some of the things I've kind of produced in that, in relation to that, not, I, I can see how this might look a little bit like self-promotion, but there's kind of a thread here that I kind of want to explain and see to kind of explain where the product is at and to kind of explain where this paper that I'm presenting today is coming from. So I kind of, uh, to begin with, just uh, in my in my book, um, which, which Jess kindly alluded to, um, in chapter three, I looked at the um, relationship between fluctuating levels of rainfall, um, agricultural yields, and epidemics of smallpox, particularly in um, Ujiji on the northeastern shore of Lake Tanganyika. But then the actual projects that have kind of, the, the papers and articles that have kind of formed the basis um, of this particular project um, started in 2019 um, with a focus on uh, one single uh, flooding event um, in a very small area um, of the coastal hinterland and linking that flooding event to an epidemic of bovine trypanosomiasis, otherwise known as uh, bovine sleeping sickness. Um, since then, um, I kind of expanded the geographical, spoke, look, geographical scope uh, looking at the same kind of uh, flooding event, uh, linking it to El Nino in Indian Ocean dipole anomalies, um, and also thinking about wider themes as well, including the effects on agricultural yields, the spread of smallpox, and violence in the peripheries of established states um, in Eastern Africa. And this came started taking me not just the coastal hinterland, but also to inland Tanzania uh, and as far uh, as southern uh, Uganda as well. Uh, then from there, I've kind of tried to expand the temporal scope a little bit, taking on the, in the next paper down uh, climate change and political instability uh, in equatorial Eastern Africa. I'm um, looking at an eight year period instead of, kind of a one or two year period um, and linking um, a longer period of climatic instability uh, just under a decade, uh, which included three severe droughts and one se season with significant flooding to the collapse of two of the region's most significant centralized states, um, Buganda in present-day Uganda and Mirambo State in present-day West Central Tanzania, and also thinking about societal vulnerability uh, in these contexts as well. And then finally, uh, and this is the forthcoming uh, article, which is coming out in the next issue of the International Review of Environmental History, uh, which I'm which part of the reason why I'm so thrilled to present to you guys, because uh, knowing that the, that that journal is um, from the Australian National uh, University Press, um, and obviously being linked to ANU here, 
Um, but this this kind of links has an even has focuses on a kind of a small area of West Central Tanzania again. Um, but we're kind of expanding the temporal scope to the entirety of the 1870s and beginning of, 18, of the 1890s, and also bringing in the last decades of the Little Ice Age as well, with the it, by looking at the 1830s. Um, if you're interested, this is kind of a long reading list. If you're interested in kind of this kind of these kind of thematic linkages between climate change and uh, uh, East and uh, historical change uh, in 19th century East Africa, this latter one I think is probably the most interesting one. Uh, it's going to be open access as well, and it cites all the others, so it kind of covers a lot of the bases um, that the other ones do as well. Basically, the pattern has been to gradually expand the regional and temporal scope of kind of the, the studies that I've been attempting to do with an attempt to start to get to grips with the early 19th century, having started mostly on the late 19th century as well, including the late Little Ice Age. But in conducting this expansion, I feel like I'm starting to get to the limits of my current approach, which has, as I said, um, relied largely on a mixture of historical methods, uh, mostly focusing on documentary materials from archives and on existing climatological research. And there are a few things to bear in mind, which kind of shed light on the limitations here. The documentary record is uh, very thin. Uh, it only exists for inland regions of Eastern Africa from, in terms of direct um, primary reports, not secondary reports, uh, from the 1850s. Um, these are written, these early reports are written by so-called explorers, kind of some famous names include David Livingston, uh, John Hanning Speak, uh, Richard Burton, Henry Morton Stanley. Um, and then from 1876 onwards, uh, a series of missionaries, uh, several missionaries settled in the region um, from the Church Missionary Society, the London Missionary Society, uh, and the White Fathers, um, the Catholic White Fathers. Um, and there, so you can kind of see, kind of from this kind of trajectory, considering that most of the like, when when the the um, documentary sources become kind of more abundant from about 1876, this kind of also aligns with kind of where I focused my research so far. So my research has been very much focused along like the kind of the temporal limits of the um, of the of the archival materials. These archival materials are problematic for a variety of reasons, as is well known to African historians. There are several challenges with, with uh, analyzing them. Um, but one of the things for climate history in particular is that they perpetually emphasize um, the uh, ex climatic extremes. Um, they regularly report on floods. They regularly report on droughts. Um, and they report less on climatic conditions when they might be normal. And which I think these normal normal conditions um, or relatively normal conditions are probably just as significant on a long term basis uh, as uh, these epi episodes of drought or floods. Um, but we have a lot less information on those. So if you kind of see the kind of the titles of all, all those um, articles I've mentioned, um, I'm regularly reporting, writing articles on things like droughts and floods, which again is in alignment with the themes of the archive. And I kind of need to feel like this is project's going to reach its full potential and need to break out of that, need to start commenting more uh, on the importance of years of regular rainfall as well, which don't really get reported on very much in the archive. But a major challenge of trying to access these um, histories um, on in the context of uh, regular, kind of more regular climatic conditions, is that there, uh, there is a dearth of climatological materials as well, focusing on East Africa. The only natural proxies that have been analyzed in the region are from lakes. That's limnological uh, and paleolimnological research. Uh, and one of these studies um, kind of portends to kind of suggest that potentially the, the reconstructed levels of Lake Tanganyika give a, a kind of give an indication of a five year running average of rainfall. Uh, so this is kind of a lot less resolution than what you're getting from the documents, which are kind of suggesting there's a drought in this season or in this month. And here you only kind of get indications of broader trends from um, five years. Most of these, most of these studies, however, kind of thinking a decade or even multi-decadal or centennial scales instead. I've cited one of them here, uh, one of such um, study here. It's actually one of, one of the older ones, but I like this figure and it kind of gives a, a good kind of sense of 
uh, what uh, of, of some kind of broad trends uh, which are which are interesting. Um, these are is there, these are graphs showing um, reconstructed um, patterns of lake level fluctuations uh, in from uh, 1800 down here all the way to the year 2000. Um, and they um, indicate, and the, what, the important ones, I think, are the ones from Lake Stephanie all the way down to Chilwa, um, Chad and Ungami um, are all the way up here and all the way down here. So kind of outside the zone that I'm, that I'm looking at. And they're also kind of some, some pretty similar uh, patterns, particularly from Lake Rukwa uh, and further north, whereby you've got very low levels of lakes uh, in the early part of the 19th century. Uh, and then rising uh, from most of from about 1840 onwards uh, to a sharp peak in the late 1870s and then a sharp decline uh, thereafter. And that's kind of kind of a broad trend that you can get from these uh, studies. But again, you don't have the kind of high resolution that you get from documents or from other natural proxies such as tree rings, um, which um, just haven't been studied in the region um, for um, for a, a, a few reasons. Um, but it's uh, it's a shame that they have not been done so yet. So the kind of the challenge is, can I make a high resolution time series that gives an indication of seasonal rainfall for at least some of the period that I'm reviewing? That's the 18th and 19th century, uh, which give which will give an indication of both abundant and lean years in seasons. So two bits of context here um, is firstly the, the answer is I think is yes. And that's what I'm going to present to you today. Uh, I've been working with two climatologist colleagues at the University of Sussex. That's uh, Dr. Melissa Lazenby and Dr. Mick Frogley, um, as well as two undergraduate RAs at the Indian Ocean World Center. That's Cecile Dai and Wenki Su uh, to make this come to fruition. Uh, and the work that we've done together is what I'm presenting today. And I just want to make sure that they get acknowledged that um, this doesn't come together at all without um, their expertise uh, and input. So this is very much collaborative research that I'm presenting. The other bit of context is that something uh, along, something close to these lines has been attempted before. Uh, and this is um, Nicholson, Disvuli and Clotter's 2012 data set, um, which is a two century precipitation data set for the entirety of the continent of Africa, which is on an annual scale using the Gregorian calendar. Sorry, the, 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 the yeah, the Gregorian calendar. Um, and this, um, and I've kind of, they, they split the entirety of the African continent into around 90 different climate zones, uh, and then used a seven point index, whereby minus three is indicative of, uh, minus three is indicative of severe drought, plus three is severe floods, uh, and uh, zero is just normal levels of rainfall. Uh, and they used a mixture, and they constructed an annual scale, and, and basically used it on an annual scale, uh, January to December, um, for the entirety of the 19th century, uh, they basically estimated for all the all these different zones. I've highlighted the zones, uh, the black, the ones that are bracketed in black here are the zones that correspond to the ones in East Africa. So we have 30, uh, so 37 and 38 are these two ones here on an annual scale. Um, this database. Uh, or data set was put together with a mixture of hydrological sources, so natural proxies. Uh, from East Africa, we're talking about um, uh, limnological research, uh, oral traditions, uh, documents, uh, and spatial analyses. Uh, Nicholson, however, who is the specialist in East Africa here, um, has admitted that the research was somewhat thin on documentary data and has since called for more hist historians to introduce data. So that's what I'm trying to do with some documents here, and, uh, and I'll show you kind of the fruits of that work. Um, so what uh, Melissa, Mick, Cecile, Wanky and I are doing is partly in response to that call by Nicholson to kind of refine, use documentary sources to kind of refine and add to this kind of data set. And the other thing we're doing is we're actually using climatological materials that have been produced since the publication of this data set as well. And I'll give you some more information on that too. Okay, so what are we actually trying to do specifically just with this collaboration at the moment? And depending on how well, depending on how well it's received and if we can get it through peer review, um, it's the kind of thing that will hopefully scale up in the future as well. Um, what we're trying to do at the moment is to make a seasonal um, time series for three locations within present day Tanzania from 1856. So that's the beginning uh, of the documentary record 
to 1890, um, which is the beginning of European, for, kind of the beginning of formal European colonialism. And they start recording uh, in different ways and there are different archives, which I have not consulted. Uh, and there's also the introduction of more regular introduction of rain gauges. Uh, so this is just more st statistical records for this uh, for, from 1890 as well. Uh, the three locations that we're interested in uh, are uh, marked on this map. Uh, let's get a little pen. We're going Mpwapwa here, uh, Tabora here, uh, and Ujiji here. Um, these um, are the three, these were the three largest and most important commercial centers in the region during the 19th century. And their importance means that the documentary record is fairly abundant for these locales, at least compared to um, elsewhere in the region. So how are we doing this? We are doing this by, I want to get rid of my pen now. Uh, we'll figure that out in a second. Um, we're doing this by combining data from documentary sources. So that's kind of my specialism as a historian, including from the London Missionary Society Archive, the Church Missionary Society Archive, and the White Fathers Archive, and combining that data with data from climate reanalysis uh, and global climatic models. Um, next one here. Okay, so what's global climatic reanalysis? Um, global climatic reanalysis uses observational data, so that's things like tree rings and sea surface pressure, to model climatic conditions where observational data is lacking. So observational data, data in fact, in natural proxy data, is uh, lacking for Ecuador or Eastern Africa. There are three main products in this context. Uh, as far as I'm aware, though, if there are climatologists in the audience um, who want to tell me some other ones that I've missed, uh, please do tell me. Uh, the ones that I'm aware of are the last millennium reanalysis uh, and the paleohydrodynamics data assimilation, so that's LMR and FIDA. Both of these are on an annual scale, uh, or the FIDA one is for uh, has uh, kind of some breakdowns as well, uh, but they all intersect with the region, Ecuador, Eastern Africa's um, rainy season, so they aren't actually very useful for producing a seasonal database. Um, they're better for longer term analyses, and I'll definitely be using them for earlier periods before 1856. Um, but that's kind of part of the next part of the project. Um, but the other one, um, the one that we're using for this project is the 20th century reanalysis, which um, gives daily and or monthly conditions. Uh, we're using the latter. Uh, and we're combining the monthly data to make a to make a um, seasonal time series. Um, and I just want to kind of actually because I think most of the audience here are um, historians, uh, both are climatologists here. I'm sorry for doing, sorry for this, but I'm actually wanna kind of give you kind of an insight of what this 20th century reanalysis actually is and what it, what, what it, what it looks like. It, the beauty of it um, is that it is completely open access uh, and really easy to use, uh, even for historians like myself. I'm giving you the link there. And this is the KNMI Climate Explorer. Um, and this is completely open access. Um, and you can access it straight away. Uh, and I've put the link in my, in the, um, in my PowerPoint. And here you can go, go down, down the side here, click monthly reanalysis fields. You'll see there's all sorts of different reanalyses, uh, one from 1950, one from 1980. The one you want is for 20th century reanalysis version three. Uh, which starts in 1836. It's the only one that actually begins uh, in the 19th century. It actually has uh, a plugin uh, which isn't open access yet, which begins in 1806, but I believe that they're still not quite ready to roll that out entirely yet. Um, so hopefully that's something to look forward to. Um, and then you've got the different kind of types of things that we construct. So we construct um, zonal winds, meridional winds, but the one we want here is precipitation um, because that's what we're interested in, rainfall variability. Uh, select field. Now I was gonna, because kind of at random, um, I have chosen, because this has been presented in Canberra, uh, I'm gonna give you Canberra's coordinates in here. Canberra's coordinates are um, 35.28 south. So let's put minus 35.2, sorry, 0 0.2. Minus 35.3, and you are 149.13.1, and then 149.2. There you go. That, so Canberra is in those coordinates. I'm going to convert all the data to millimeters per day because um, that's the most useful, easy to use. 
I'm going to achieve you some data. And it will get there when we find out. Here we go. And then we'll go. So here's a visualization of that, that data. Here's the raw data. So basically, what the by using um, natural proxy evidence and the 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 20th century analysis primarily uses sea level pressure um, as its proxy. Um, it this is telling you um, an estimation of how much rainfall fell per month in all of these month in all these points. So here for 1836, this is January is the first column. So in January, it reckons that in um, I don't reckon that's right. Hold on, I put something in wrong. No, no. All right. Fair enough. I did this earlier. I could just warn the numbers were different. Um, <laughs> in any case, um, you have to you have to put make sure correct, check my coordinates. In any case, um, one thing to, to note as well is that it doesn't quite give you the exact coordinates. It's going to give you um, a. Uh, that's what it is. I do see the error here. Hold on. Why is that? The error is there is an error here. That should be minus thirty five point five to minus that didn't put a negative somewhere. There, there is a negative. If I put a negative, where's the negative? There shouldn't be a negative. Oh, um, latitude. Thank, is it that? There, is that it? Thank you. I don't know whether that got fixed. Is that better? Oh, in any case, I've definitely messed this up at some point, but we can skip that. What it's going to tell what I think that this is that this is better. This is what I saw earlier. It's definitely seeing minus twos and minus one, seeing twos and minus one, seeing twos and ones earlier. I think that's actually right now. But in any case, this is giving you an estimation using natural proxy records for a monthly rainfall uh, in um, wherever you put in the coordinates. And it's over, it's on one by one grid squares, as you can kind of see from this is what it um, looks like. Uh, this is. Uh, it's not, but in any case, I've definitely confused it. But play around with it. It's way more fun. It's kind of fun to actually to, to get to grips with it. I'm sorry, the fault here is definitely me, not with the system. Um, mm -hmm. So apologies for that. Um, but it kind of gives you in columns here, um, 1836, January, it reckons that in this locale, which I think is Canberra, um, it, it reckons about 2.45 millimeters per day of rainfall fell. Uh, and then February, March, April, and keep on moving along with that. And it gives you a nice big table uh, of suggestions um, for how it works. And as far as I'm aware, and I'd love people to correct me, there are very few historians who are actually using this kind of data as kind of a as a way to try and shed light on um, history. Um, this is kind of some kind of historical data that you could possibly use. Uh, and so kind of the project here is kind of trying to integrate this kind of data in a way that is methodologically um, sound. Uh, um, for historical practice as well. So that's reanalysis using observational data to estimate rainfall across the entirety of the globe. Um, let's get rid of that. The other one is um, global climatic models or GCMs. Um, and these simulate the climate system based on natural and anthropogenic um, climate forcing. So natural climate forcings are like orbital, solar and volcanic forcings uh, or anthropogenic ones include, include well-mixed greenhouse gases, ozone, tropospheric aerosols and land use um, and these kind of forcings. Um, and there are several products, but the one that has the most abundant data for the second half of the 19th century is CMIP-5, which if you scroll around the KNMI Climate Explorer, you'll find actually data from CMIP-5 as well. Although I haven't used that, I, that was entirely my um, entirely my um, collaborators who accessed that. So I'm not going to even attempt to kind of give a short, quick demonstration of that because um, I'll definitely screw that one up even more so than I screwed up the um, the reanalysis. So basically, the idea is to try and combine these three sources: documents, um, reanalysis, and GCMs. Um, to make a time series for rainfall that's interdisciplinary coming across climatology and history. Um, uh, now, I think this is actually uh, a necess necessity, uh, particularly for this region. It comes from it partly from an admission. Um, I don't think that any of these sources on their own are particularly good at estimating rainfall um, in the region in the 19th century. Documents, for example, were written almost entirely by Europeans, um, such as by the, the so-called explorers and missionaries, and they had regularly a distorted understanding of the peoples, environments and climates they encountered. 
they also discuss climate conditions irregularly. So, for example, although the first Europeans to document enviroclimatic conditions in inland Tanzania did so in 1856 to 61, and others did not do so ne until nearly a decade later in 1869. Further, no Europeans documented changing climate in a particular locale until the first missionaries settled in 1876, and even then their reporting was uneven. uneven. Thus, any index time series made solely from European documents would necessarily rely on thin data, especially for the earlier decades under review, for which there is often no data at all. Meanwhile, the reanalysis in GCMs, neither of these sources incorporate information that's natural or documentary from any part of Africa. Um, this applies to all the products I mentioned as well, not just the ones we are using. And I think for Africanists in the humanities and social sciences, Africa's absence from the underlying data makes deploying the projections very uncomfortable, as it partly represents Africa's marginalization from global scientific discourse during and after colonialism, as well as it builds in some inaccuracies too. Nevertheless, and I'm going to say this, uh, nevertheless, and I think this is important to say, is that the models are tantalizing, especially for East Africanists. Uh, depending on the product used, they suggest daily, monthly, or annual estimations of rainfall, all of which represent a greater temporal resolution than that which is gatherable from the natural proxies from the region that have been analyzed up to now, which are mostly limited to lake sediments. Thus, basically, we envisage that combining these three imperfect different data sources will enable an interpretation of rainfall variability in 19th century East Africa that is both somewhat locally grounded in that it incorporates documents that were made in and of the region, as well as scientifically grounded in that it accounts for the latest advances in two different methods of global climate reconstruction. So how are we doing this? Um, we're starting off by working with them independently, obviously, and I'll start with the documents here. Um, let's skip forward. Do you, I start doing this um through the process of indexing qualitative qualitative um descriptions of climatic conditions um and if you're interested in indexing i urge you to check out um nash adamson et al's um, recent kind of um summary of the global state of the art um this climate in climate indices and historical climate reconstructions which was published in climate of the past um two years ago Basically, the process of indexing climate reports or reports about climate that are descriptive, um, are qualitative, qualitative um, is a case of reading the archive and categorizing reports. Now, for our collaboration, we adopted, like Nicholson, there's Fooley and Clotter, a seven point index. Now, and these are the kind of definitions that we used that you'd assign a minus three when the description suggests that there was a drought driven famine. A minus two, when there appears to be kind of deficient levels of rainfall. Minus three, when it's just below average rainfall. Zero for above for, for regular rainfall. Uh, and then, it, then further down, uh, plus three, um, eventually is rainfall driven floods. This process very, requires actually very much reading along the archival grain. I'm trying to take my subjectivity out of it. The intention is not so much to reread them based on my own knowledge, but to reread them in the context of the analysis and the GCMs, which I'll get onto later. This um, process of indexing um, the data actually provides some challenges, of course. Some reports are easy to interpret. For example, crops threat, quote, threatening to dry out before they were mature, end quote, is a strong indica ind indicator of drought in the months leading up to the statement. And the missionary reports having to divert his direction of travel because of, quote, terribly flooded country, end quote, is probably indicative of at least excessive rainfall. By contrast, other data points where climate um, is reported on in these sources is not easy to categorize. For example, Richard Burton, who in 1857 to 8 was a member of the first European party to travel in present day inland Tanzania, wrote that Ujiji's rainy season lasted from September to May, which is contrary to scientific, current scientific knowledge, knowledge, which places the rainy season between November and April. And there are at least two possible reasons for this discrepancy. First, that the rainy season was particularly long in 1857 to 8 and that Burton made assumptions based on his own experience. Or second, that he mistakenly integrated secondary information about the lake regions of Eastern Africa into his assessment of Uji's climate, 
as September May, uh, September to May, broadly aligns with the rainy season um, on the northern shores of Lake Victoria. Nevertheless, there is a tantalizing reference to a flooded river in a normally arid zone about 100 kilometers west of Mpwapwa in September 1857, which suggests that inland, rainy, inland Tanzania's rainy season may have begun significantly early in that year. But at the same time, Burton wrote that the rainy season began around Tabora in November 1850, in November 1857, and lasting until mid-May 1858. Unfortunately, given the time gaps between different explorers' travels, there are no other documentary sources with which to verify or challenge Burton's reports. Thus, references such as these often provoke as many, quest as many questions as answers, even though they might be a suggestion in this instance of an especially protracted rainy season in certain locales. And for this, in, for this, for this reason, for these reasons of like different levels of confidence or different with ease with which to categorize data, uh, we also adopted a confidence index. A grade of one indicates a high degree of uncertainty, so not very confident at all, caused by ambiguity in the description, lack of verifying documentary material, the use of data from nearby locations as a proxy, and or proxies that are imperfect indicators of rainfall conditions, such as abundant rainfall, abundant harvests from irrigated fields which may not be an indication of abundant rainfall at all. Meanwhile, a grade of two indicates a higher degree of certainty caused by the climate conditions being described in detail by more than one source and or from within the locale to which the time series applies. So that would be Mpwapwa, Tabor, Ujiji. The result of doing this through um, three archival collections and a bunch of um, published sources was about 150 lines of data, so about 50 for each locale, uh, which is visualized in these figures coming up now. So there are a few things to note here. There are large gaps in the data. Um, so you can see the, the, um, the here's the kind of scale going across the bottom. Here's your the, the time going across in terms of in terms of years. Um, and there are large gaps. We have very little data for the 1860s. Uh, and for the first part of the 1870s, and a lot more for the late 1870s and 1880s. Um, you'll note that there are grey and black lines. The grey lines are low confidence. The black lines are, have more confidence. Um, there is a lot of uncertainty for Ujiji down here, where most of the lines are grey, uh, because a lot of the reports come from outside Ujiji, a few uh, uh, 20 or 30 kilometres outside. Um, and even then, the ones that we are confident about, we have to take into account that the missionaries may be just misinterpreting what they are seeing. You will note that also that sometimes the lines are very thin, um, particularly in the Tabora Index, we've got quite a lot of thin lines. And that's because um, we're sometimes able to make a suggestion of rainfall variability within a season. Um, and then the other thing to note, I think, is kind of as, as a pattern, particularly shown in Tabora here and also in Mpwapwa, is that from the 1870s, we have lots of reports of minus ones, minus twos, and minus threes, much more than we do for plus ones, plus twos, and plus threes. And even the plus ones, plus twos, and plus threes in Ujiji um, are uncertain, uh, and they are very thin. Like this is for like one month cycles uh, rather than for the whole entire season. Um, and these uh, kind of points towards um, general, regular, regular reports of drought and below average rainfall uh, in the 1870s and 1880s. And actually, as I kind of alluded to earlier, this is, in fact, I did allude to earlier, this is actually kind of in line with what we'd expect uh, from looking at the um, limnological research, which also suggests actually that, drought, that there was regularly below average rainfall in the late 1870s uh, and the early 1880s. So there's some correlation here between kind of these broad trends and this kind of more granular data um, that uh, we collected for, for the, from the documents in um, 19th century uh, East Africa from the, from the explorer and missionary sources. Right, uh, next. Right, the next challenge is to refine and revise these data points by incorporating data from the global climate reanalysis and global climate models. And these are easier to acquire. These are basically oh, easy to acquire if you know how. Um, which, which, quite honestly, I still don't fully know how to do. This is why I've been having to do this collaboratively uh, with with uh, my with with colleagues from the University of Sussex. Um, is and this is what it kind of looks like. This is um, rainfall anomalies measured in millimeters per day above or below average um, for all the seasons we mentioned. This is for the ones for Mpwapwa, 
Uh, on the left, you have from the reanalysis. Uh, from the right, you have from the GCMs, the Global Climatic Models, the CMIP-5. Uh, and uh, that's Mpwapwa, uh, that's Tabora, uh, and that's um, Ujiji. Now, there are a few things to, to note on here. So the precipitation is measured in millimeters per day above or below average. And this is obviously very different units to what I'm using from an index measurement. There's some kind of reconciliation we have to do there. You also note there are some similar trends um, to what I've kind of mentioned before, where we have quite a lot of blue uh, in the 60s and early 70s with more red um, afterwards. Um, although the GCM is a lot less certain about the extent of abundance pre about 1875. There's also quite significant agreement, which, which was surprising to me, about um, severe drought uh, in the late 1850s. Uh, if you see, see in all of these, if you see the first two readings in all of them, this is the right at the end of the 1850s, um, the reanalysis and GCMs um, do point to ah, severe drought in the late 1850s. Um, so there's some, some significant agreement there, but that disagrees with kind of the long, broader trends. Uh, and it doesn't come into the documents as well, but that can be because of the, we're uncertain about the documents there too. Um, there's another thing to notice here is that they are completely different scales. They use the same units, millimeters per day, but you'll see that um, we're looking about, we're looking at like one to 1 1.2 millimeters per day above and below average uh, for, um, for the reanalysis, whereas we're a lot smaller than that when we're talking about the um, GCM from the CMIP-5. This is because CMIP-5 um, is, this is probably because the CMIP-5 um, represents a multi-model ensemble mean, uh, which indicates that output anomalies are typically small due to some offsetting between different runs or models. Uh, therefore, so I think there's 25 different runs being put into this. They run the simulation 25 times using different variables. Um, thus, large anomalies, which are occasionally apparent in the reanalysis, um, are um, have been basically obscured um, by the fact that they're just averaging each other out. Okay, so there's some differences. There's some differences in units. There's some differences in scale. How do we resolve that? Firstly, this is a two-step process. So this is how we've done it, it's a two-step process. First step was to modify the temporal resolution of the documentary data um, so that it was seasonal rather than monthly. Um, and this is kind of the revised figures when you, when, when you do that. The light, the, the pinkish color is we're uncertain about it. The red color is that we're much more certain about it. In some ways, this process obscures in-season, in fact, it does completely obscure in-season rainfall variability that is apparent in some readings for the 1870s and 80s. But this approach nevertheless gives a strong indication of overall rainfall levels across entire seasons and brings the temporal resolution of the index, data, index documentary data set into line with those of the reanalysis and GCM data sets. And I think and this facilitates making comparisons between data sets at the same temporal scale. The second step was to reinterpret the reanalysis and GCM data points in terms of anomalies, rather than in terms of millimeters per day. Thus, the outputs for each data set were converted into a seven point index, a la the index documentary data sets. So I'll show you that. Um, and this basically meant multiplying each reanalysis and GCM data set by a factor that would make the most extreme anomaly equal to plus or minus 3.5. Through so the reanalysis, this was a factor of 1.6. For the GCM, this was a factor of 6.1. And the assumption was made that all index reanalysis and GCM values between minus 3 and minus 2, for example, you can see from this um, table, were broadly representative of the definitions for values, for values of minus 3 in the index data set. Um, and so this table is basically a carbon copy of the one I showed you earlier that I used for my um, a carbon copy of this one. These are the definitions that I used to um, categorize and index the documents. And now we're kind of saying that these values are going to be broadly, assuming that these values are going to be broadly indicative of the same when you use the index data set as well. So this means that they're now on the same scale, they're all on the same units. Um, now we can kind of start to try and make some direct comparisons between all three data sets. And this is kind of what we've got. Um, and you can see, again, there's some correlation and some divergences between them. Um, the, um, 
here we go, the, the key is down here. So in all of these data sets, the red or the pink uh, is the um, index, the black is the reanalysis, uh, and the blue is the GCM, the CMIP5, which is the CMIP5 data sets here. And again, you can kind of see the kind of trends I've kind of alluded to earlier. Generally abundant rainfall uh, in the 1860s and 70s with a few outliers. Uh, and then generally negative anomalies uh, in the in the uh, 1880s. So again, it kind of follows broad trends, but with some indications of what might have taken place uh, in those intermediate periods. So this is kind of what it looks like when you put them all together. <coughs> uh, we'll put them all next to each other. Now, how do you combine them? How do you make one temp one one data set for each locale? So we've made some rules for that as well. So. And this and the rules depended on the nature of the documents. When the document's confidential confidence level was one, so that's when we're not confident about it, we gave a weighting of 33%, 33.3% for each data set. So the documents, the reanalysis, and the GCM. Um, and this was justified on the basis that the documentary data points often lack specificity and or verifying material and occasionally relied on information from outside the locale under review. Uh, in this sense, it suffers from some of the same constraints of the reanalysis and GCM data points, which also rely on data collected outside of Equatorial Eastern Africa. So there's no reason to, I didn't feel like there's any kind of reason to give any more weight than the other. They're just different methods of measuring the same thing. Let's, we can't justify saying that one is better than the other at this stage. Let's give them all equal weighting and see what comes up. By contrast, Given that the date, documentary data points with a higher confidence level, that's confidence level two, are the only ones to incorporate cross-verified data from within each of the three locales, more weight was given to them when integrating them with the other two data sets. And in, those, in that instance, we gave, though, we gave the documentary data points 50% weighting and the other two 25% each. And when there's no documentary data at all, equal weight was given to the reanalysis and GCM values, 50 and 50. Having done this, we noticed that combining the data points resulted in minimizing extremes again. And you can kind of see what your see that here. This is kind of what happens when you look at them. The green points are for Mpwapra, um, the blue points are the dark blue points for Tabora, uh, and the orange points are for Ujiji. Um, and you can see that the, the, the anomalies are always um, below, um, some, some of them do go below minus two, but not by much. Um, so again, They've kind of, it's kind of the same pattern with the CMIP5 data set earlier, that I mentioned earlier. And the, the, because there's some divergence between the data sets, um, the kind of the extremes have been averaged out and you don't get the extremes anymore. So to kind of counteract that, we've multiplied everything by 1.4 so that the most extreme value is now minus 3.5. So it corresponds with the original definitions that we used, make it kind of interoperable with uh, kind of uh, the original data sets so direct comparisons can be made. And this is for the 1883, that should be 1883 to four, not 1883 to five, apologies for that um, data set. Uh, and that is what we have here. This is kind of the final figure that we've come up with um, for now. All right, so this is the final time series with the, 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 or, the, or the three time series put all together, visualized all together um, for levels of rainfall um, on, on, a, on, a, on an index with, defined, with definitions uh, for them going uh going on there and I, what i want to want to make the case for is that these time series have several implications for how historians and climatologists can interpret rainfall patterns in inland tanzania during the second half of the 19th century um from a long-term perspective they reinforce observed trends from paleolimological studies that are incorporated into nicholson des and clotter's 2012 data set um, they suggest a generally wet period during the third quarter of the 19th century, followed by a period of regular and severe droughts. The one exception, the exception to this trend actually is um, Ujiji, actually, who've got some quite um, um, period, um, indications of below average rainfall uh, uh, in the late 1860s and uh, throughout the early 1870s as well. Kind of regular mentions uh, of this. Um, and this actually may reflect depressed levels of rainfall in the catchment of Lake Tanganyika during this first part of the de decade, uh, as the limnological study suggests its level decreased slightly during this period before peaking again during a region-wide season of excessive rainfall in 1877 to 1878. This kind of point you towards that as well um, here. Um, 
did not build this to happen, did not even think that it would happen, um, really. But you can kind of point to here, um, the, the limnological studies actually suggest that there was a small period of below, a small period of below age rainfall in the 1860s, and in, in, well, at least in the early 1870s, um, contrary to all the other um, mm -hmm. um, lakes which have a kind of a go up and then down. There's a kind of a little divot in the lake level there, um, going to the limnological research. And actually, this kind of comes out in our in in, in our data set, which I was well kind of pleased about um, and surprised too, and that we'd be able to kind of see this. Um, but however, so apart from these broad trends on a micro level, the time series provides several precisions to existing climatological studies and standard interpretations of archival materials referring to rainfall. And I want to give you um, three examples. Um, oh, and so I want to give you four examples to kind of illustrate that. The first of these I want to refer to is droughts in 1850, in around 1856 to about 1860. Existing climatological studies do not point to drought in inland Tanzania during this period. Um, Nicholson, Desfouli, and Clotter's data set suggest consecutive seasons of regular and or slightly above average rainfall. Also, historian Yuhani Kopanen used evidence from all traditions to suggest a period of widespread drought during the 1860s. But these time series suggest an earlier date for such phenomena may be more appropriate, possibly corresponding to a drought in all traditions recorded in the region of Ugogo, which borders Mpropwa. At the same time, standard readings of Spink's account of his second visit to the region would place the drought, which contributed to famine around Tabora and towards Mpwapwa in 1859 to 60, so right at the end of this period. However, the time series suggests that the famine probably resulted instead from a longer term period of environmental adversity that reaches apex as Speak visited. Grout may have been putting pressure on agricultural production for several years leading up to 1859 to 60, which decreased reserves that may otherwise have mitigated against crop failure. Moreover, warfare, which Speak reported on, and migration may have further hindered the 1859 to 60 harvest, while also increasing demand for food, especially around Tabora. Failure of the rains or below average rainfall in 1859 to 60 probably contributed to a longer term environmental crisis affecting parts of inland Tanzania in the late, 1850, late 1850s and up to 1860. Nevertheless, there's still, still some uncertainty about the geographical extent of this drought. Although, although both the reanalysis and GCM data sets indicate severe drought across the region in 1856 to 7 and 1957 to 8, this contrasts with the inference on Burton's account that the rainy season started early in Ujiji during that year, owing to his claim that Ujiji's rainy season began in September. The climatological data suggests Burton and the natural inference from his account is incorrect. However, both the reanalysis and GCM data sets also suggest abundant rainfall in 1859 to 60, but this is not, but this is not supported by the much more certain account, pro account provided by Speak in these years. In this instance, Speak's data unequivocally indicates drought around Mpwapwa and Tabora, and so the interdisciplinary time series revised down the estimations of rainfall made by the reanalysis and GCM data sets for these years. The challenge, however, is that Speak's account of this season does not provide any data for Ujiji. So the estimation for um, so the estimation for rainfall in that locale may be erroneously high, relying as it, relying as it does only on these data sets. And you can kind of see that here. That's this lot here. This 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 big Ujiji up here, while the Mpwapwa and Tabora are down. This is indicating that the GCM. This is only the GCM and the reanalysis data set putting this high. And these ones would be a lot lower if it wasn't for the, if it were lower according to the documents, um, but, but the GCMs uh, and, and reanalysis makes it a little bit higher. But we don't have any documents for this data, for this region. So, for, so this means these ones are a lot lower because documents bring it down, but we don't have any documents to bring this one down too. But we can't make that, we haven't got the data to make that inference about the about this, how um, if, if there was deficient levels of rainfall in, um, in Ujiji, like there was in um, around Tabora and Mpwapwa. Here, and I do believe this, and it's something that, that needs to be kind of reiterated, only the incorporation of higher resolution natural proxies, such as tree rings, could provide more certainty about the depth, duration, and special extent of the drought. Next one I want to talk about is the 1876-78 drought and floods. <clears throat> I've recently given attention to the period 1876-78 with a couple of publications which I alluded to earlier. Um, and I studied them in the context of wider global climatic anomalies that affected the Indonesian monsoon zone, 
which are triggered by extremes of positive El Nino and El Ni Indian Ocean dipole events. This research, so this is my research that I produced and published already, um, relied pretty much solely on missionary sources and it suggested widespread drought in the 1876 to 77 season and abundant rainfall in the 1877 to 78 season. The time series reinforced this hypothesis to a point. Although it supports the general pattern, at least in Tabora, the level of anomaly may not have been as extreme as previously suggested. In this instance, the fact that missionaries were only just entering the region in 1876 may have influenced them to overstate the unusual nature of the climatic conditions they witnessed, partly because they were yet to understand what was and what was not normal. However, these years also are also among those with the greatest divergence between data sets that underpin the time series. In 1876-7, the reanalysis suggests excessive levels of rainfall, and in 1877-78, the GCM suggests below average levels of rainfall. Such results are inconsistent with the usual teleconnections between East African climate and positive ENSO and IDEA, IOD events, um, although these are kind of still under investigation about how much they do play a role in the region's climate. Thus, inconsistency in the climate models and reanalysis may have offset um, extreme anomalies that are suggested in the documentary data and which are reflected in the wider region affected by the Indian Ocean monsoon system. Thanks, Jessica, for that. Um, thirdly, I want to refer to the, so again, just to kind of what would help here, again, be high resolution natural proxies, such as from tree rings to kind of really give you some more indication there to, to kind of balance out what's making the what's making these uh, seem inconsistent. The next one, though, is much more hopeful. This is the 1883 to 4 drought. The time series suggests that the 1883 to 4 season experienced the deepest drought during the period under review. Uh, this is in line with recent historical work by myself and by Stephen Rockle that emphasized, emphasizes the importance of rainfall deficiency in this season to a range of historical processes, including food security, epidemics, trade, migration, and political, and political stability, which in turn may have undermined resistance to the imposition of colonial rule in the 1890s. It also challenges Nicholson, Desfouli and Clotter's 2012 characterization of the season, which suggests that conditions in 1883 to 4 were much like they were in most of the 1880s. The reason that this, this season stands out in the time series is that all three data sets, the documents, the reanalysis and the GCMs, agree that rainfall is at least below average in this year, with most points suggesting either deficient or famine levels, according to the definitions. In this sense, the climatological materials support standard interpretations of the archive, giving scientific support for recent historical research. Finally, I want to give you the 1885 to 8 droughts. Um, the time series point to below average or deficient levels of rainfall across much of the region in three consecutive rain seasons between the end of 1885 uh, and um, April 1888. This is broadly in line with Nicholson, Desfouli, and Clotter's 2012 data set in that they suggest below average, rain, below, below average or deficient levels of rainfall across the years 1886 to 8 with 1887 being the year of the deepest and most widespread drought. It does, however, contravene standard interpretations of the documentary material, which suggests that drought conditions did not become established until the 1886 to seven season in Tabora, um, the 1887 to eight season in Mpwapwa, or at all in Ujiji. Thus absence of discussion about drought and missionary correspondence in 1885 to six, they reflect the fact that dearth of rainfall had yet to, yet to severely impact the societies in which they lived. Missionaries then only began to report on it when drought-related shortages began to affect them in subsequent years of deficient rainfall, especially in Papua and Tabora, for which the documentary material is relatively abundant. I also want to make two kind of conclusions here, just to wrap up. From a historian's perspective, I think incorporation of climatological data allows for a more scientifically grounded method for analyzing documentary materials that refer to climatic variability and its effects. I think this is especially important for inland 19th century East Africa, for which the documentary material is thin in both quantity and quality. Thus reports of drought, which are regular in the archive for present day inland Tanzania over the entire period under review, can be contextualized within longer term climatic trends. A recurring theme is that such reports may often be more indicative of when droughts began to adversely affect the societies within which Europeans lived or visited, not when the drought set in. Thus, incorporation of climatological materials challenges the subjectivity of 19th century European observers 
And I expect that this approach could be used in other regions, especially in the global south, where European authored texts dominate the documentary record, even though those same, Euro same European authors regularly misunderstood the climatic and environmental conditions they reported on. From a climatologist standpoint, Integration of documentary sources with reanalysis and GCM data adds much needed precision to existing knowledge about past climatic conditions in inland Tanzania. Such a methodology is particularly, necessarily, is particularly necessary because high resolution natural proxies have yet to be investigated in the region. Moreover, the ways in which global climatic tether connections affect levels of rainfall in this region are still under, under investigation. Thus, direct evidence from the region in the form of historical documents, which have hitherto been overlooked by historical climatologists focusing on East African climate, allow the models to be deployed with greater certainty, notwithstanding some discrepancies between historical and climatological data. A challenge moving forward will be to establish how incorporation of documentary materials into reanalysis models can be, a can be achieved at a global scale. Nevertheless, confidence in the reanalysis and GCMs is supported by a general correlation between the levels um, their estimations of rainfall have and what might be expected from analysis of paleolimnological research in the region. And this allows them to be deployed with a qualified degree of uncertainty in the seasons for which documentary data is absent. Um, I think that's going to wrap me up here. I um, really look forward to your questions. This is the first time I presented something so climatological. I think um, I'd be, yeah. Questions are very much welcome. Thank you very much.